It's ten times the terror. Hello there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ralph, and welcome to Ten Times the Terror. I'm here with my co-host, Paul Leggett. And today we are very thrilled to have with us a wonderful Christian man and a great producer, Ralph Winter. Ralph, it's such a pleasure. Welcome on to the show. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for inviting me to uh, join you. Yes, and uh, we're going to start off, I, I guess, by letting Paul, because Paul is my resident or our resident uh, scholar, if you would, on Marvel Comics and, and, and the films and so forth. Uh, that's you know that's his primary uh, area of interest and, and yeah. knowledge. So I'm going to let Paul kind of take it away, as Jackie Gleason used to say. So Paul, it's, yeah. It's, before we even get ahead. into that, uh, we're getting into one of Ralph's special, Ralph Vasorno's specialties in the science fiction is the uh, Star Trek films. Uh, and uh, I, wow. I think we just to start off with that, uh, Ralph. Um, you we worked on a number of those. <clears throat> uh, what was that like? Well, I loved working on the Star Trek movies. I have. A long history with uh, the the original cast, and uh, I was very privileged and honored to be able to work on really Star Trek's two through six, the Wrath of Khan through the Undiscovered Country. I started work at Paramount Pictures my first day in the commissary, the studio commissary. I was in line behind two six foot five Klingons in full makeup. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I just, uh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but um, it turned out well. On? And uh, <laughs> You know, it's funny. We hired uh, Mark, who wrote the Klingon Dictionary, and he taught us. He invented that language for the movies. And, yeah, he taught us some words. Kopla, <clears throat> success, uh, honor, <laughs> all that. So uh, that's become... Uh, you know, sort of pop culture with Big Bang Theory and others. But Mark Okran was uh, a scholar and linguist uh, back east. He jumped in and helped us. And so he was able to write the Klingon Dictionary, which is probably still in print. Do you know Herman Zimmerman, Ralph? Very well. I do know Herman. I heard Herman on a couple of movies. He was our production designer uh, on a couple of movies. And he's uh, terrific. So yeah, um, very creative and, and inventive and a smart man. How, how would you, you know, how would you summarize the difference in the films of the later years uh, compared to the ones that you were involved with? I think the ones we made <clears throat> in the '80s and '90s are a different era. You know, Nick Meyer sort of categorized those movies as, you know, Horatio Hornblower and. You know, it was great galleons in space. And Nick had his, has and probably still does an affinity for space opera. And th- those, those movies were made in a different era. For instance, on The Wrath of Khan, Bill Shatner and Ricardo Montalban never were in a scene together on stage. It was all done on view screens. They were on different ships and they never actually met uh, on camera. But can't do that today and and that sort of operatic posturing as well as uh that era of filmmaking is gone and i don't think you make those movies today so i was you know privileged to be a part of that certainly recognizing i was a child then i'm not old i was just a child but um that was a joke uh i'm sorry (laughs) no that's right but he uh you know, I, I think those that style of filmmaking and storytelling um, mm-hmm. had its place in those years, and I think it's changed a bit. And you know, we weren't zipping around in space; those were great big, you know, galleons moving mm-hmm. through space deliberately and firing from their, their you know, their mm-hmm. guns on the sides of their ships. Yeah. Harkening back to Horatio Hornblower, so that was a different I, style. I know that uh, being a you know a fan of the show myself, uh, mm. I get a great a, a much greater sense 
in the next generation uh, series that it's more uh, uh well it's less a hierarchical structure in which you have you know three central characters who are very mm-hmm. aloof you, you you know you have uh, yes. Spock, Kirk and McCoy and they're the characters and the other people are just kind of like set there to push buttons and maybe have a little line or two I know I talked to Walter Koenig he was saddened that the characters you know the the minor which is it's a kind of an insult to call them minor but they were considered like, you know, secondary characters. Maybe Scotty probably was the most popular of that. But in the next generation, you get a sense that this is a real team effort that not only in the show itself, but outside the show, that there's a sense of uh, family, that they still uh, stay together closely. And, um, it, you know, it's a much warmer kind of setting. Do you, do, would you agree with that? I, I wasn't involved with the next generation, although I was asked to produce that and declined because I wanted to do other things. And so Rick Berman took yeah. that, but, and they did a great job. And I think that maybe, I don't know if specifically you'd have to ask Rick, but I would think that's a specific pushback to what probably just evolved on the original TV series of those characters becoming the sort of <clears throat> inner circle, you know, it just sort of evolved that way. Certainly during the movies, I encountered from Walter and from Nichelle, you know, they didn't want to, Nichelle didn't want to be the galactic space operator just answering calls. She wanted something more specific to do. I think we did the best job on the voyage home of giving each of the characters, you know, their own arc and their things to do. Uh, Walter tracking down stuff with the Enterprise, the Wessel, um, Nicole having her arc. So that was an attempt to do that. But, you know, you've also got seven, you know, leads in a sense. And in a TV show, you can give, okay, this is Scotty's episode. Okay, this is Walter's episode. You can do that. It's a lot harder in the movies to weave seven stories together. It's more expedient to have, you know, Captain Kirk and his, you know, emotional side and his logical side being fleshed out with, McCoy and uh, Spock. I I know as a, a as a as a pastor and theologian that uh, Roddenberry, uh, you know, w- was a very unique guy and had many many gifts and uh, a, you know great vision. But I I also know that um, for various reasons he he wanted to keep the show uh, separated mm-hmm. from ideas of of religion and he wanted to kind of yes. elevate the human. The human element that by that time we've gone, you know, we've evolved and there's no longer war and we get along with one another and and de-elevate mm-hmm. the idea of the need for God or sin or whatever. And I I always thought that uh, the show probably uh, tried to tried to struggle with that whole concept of Roddenberry's because what I always thought was interesting um, is that the Klingons afford a an opening into spirituality in other words the klingons are not like most of the people in the federation who are you know uh not 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 into religion or god they have their traditions their religion uh they always Mm. seem to be able to pull off you know this whole idea especially in the second series of of some sense of deep spirituality uh, 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 would you would you agree with that you know again i didn't do the second series the next generation so i can't really speak to that um i can tell you that yes roddenberry envisioned a utopian future where we would all get along and um uh, everything be worked out that came into conflict even on the wrath of khan in 81 with with uh, Nick Meyer on the Wrath of Khan, that, you know, we had fire extinguishers on the bridge of the Enterprise. That raised eyebrows for Roddenberry. And he also, Nick put up a no smoking sign on the bridge of the Enterprise. And Roddenberry threw a fit, saying, people aren't going to smoke in the future. And Nick said, talking about, people have been smoking for centuries and they'll continue to smoke regardless of what you say the scientific and health reasons are, <laughs> people will smoke. And it became a flashpoint of 
do we or don't we keep that on the set? And of course, in true movie fashion, that discussion didn't happen until the day of shooting where Roddenberry flipped out and I got to roll the cameras. I got to shoot. We can't just stand around and talk about some philosophical, you know, consideration while we're burning, you know, in those days, probably a hundred thousand dollars a day. Are we shooting or aren't we, what are we doing? Um, so th- that was, a, you know, the, those flashpoints came up with Roddenberry about some of those things. But in general, I think in the movies, you have to admire that Roddenberry picked a, you know, a position, a philosophical position and stuck to it and tried to uh, flesh that out in the original series, the, the movies with the original cast and with The Next Generation. I, I, I didn't yeah. follow the Klingons and The Next Generation, so I really can't speak Right. Uh, I, I have one more question, then we can go on to something other. But um, okay. of, all, of all the cast members, you know, the original uh, crew, was there one person you particularly enjoyed working with or knowing? Well, look, I love all my children, right? You don't want to pick one. <laughs> um, but Leonard was was uh, certainly as a director on three and four and as an actor to uh, relate with. He was a little cool, but he was smart and relatable. And we had a good time together, uh, working together. I did get the chance to work with Bill extensively and did another movie outside of Star Trek with Bill. And I find him to be an enjoyable fun loving smart um you know person i haven't had that much interaction little interaction with michelle not much with walter i had a little with uh, with scotty uh and i loved hanging around uh, mccoy uh, but you know he left us too soon and um so yeah they're they're all, they're all a lot of fun leonard I, you know i had a closer relationship with leonard because he directed two of the movies that I produced and Bill directed one of them. So um, they're all fun. They're all, they all have uh, <laughs> yeah. good news and yeah. bad news about each one. So, okay, well, let's, let's move on, Paul. I'd like, uh, yeah, I, I had a, 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 a complete disclosure. I began collecting comic books in 1958. And oh, great. Uh, I dropped awesome. out uh, when I first went to high school because uh, comic books at, at that point were not regarded as something that was cool for teenagers. Right. And then, then though, uh, famous story of the Esquire uh, uh, cover in the mid-60s, which showed the four most in- influential figures on campus, on college campuses, and uh, John F. Kennedy was one of them. And, of course, uh, Spider-Man and the Hulk were yeah. two of the others. And, uh, um, and of course, I remember very much the uh, beginning and, and the development of X-Men, uh, which, of mm-hmm. course, you, you did a whole number of films with. Uh, and even at that time, it seemed that X-Men was really picking up so many strands of the civil rights movement, the whole idea yes. of discrimination and, yes. and intolerance yes. and all of that. Uh, yeah, so talk, yeah, talk a little bit about working on, on X-Men. Well... You know, you're exactly right. And I think, oddly enough, through my son, who I didn't realize where his allowance was going, I had a whole research library at home of comics that my son had collected. And it was really in sort of embracing, you know, some of those original comics that you begin to see how Stan Lee and others were entering that that dialogue about you know, should we live together or should we live apart? A bit of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And that really embodies, you know, uh, the two characters with Charles Xavier trying to figure out how can we all work together? Rodney King, can't we get along? You know, isn't there a way for us to work this out? Whereas the Ian McKellen character is, much more we should separate ourselves and it's never going to work stop trying to figure that out we just need to be apart and leave us alone and uh, so yeah i think that dynamic is certainly in the movies it certainly has its roots in the 60s and brian singer interpreted that 
not just racially, but, you know, with gay and straight. And, you know, I think the enduring legacy of X-Men is that in the broadest sense, is there a place for me? Do I fit in? Is there value for me if I'm 14 or I'm 84? How do I relate to and where do I fit? And I don't, I, I think that's a relevant question that continues to be important. You know, are you irrelevant because you're, you're a COVID candidate and you're 84 years old and we should forget about you and you don't have value in society? We're going to put you in a, in a, a, a rehab or a nursing home? I mean, those kinds of things, certainly shaped by pop culture, um, you know, it's, you got to push back on some of that stuff to find out what's valuable, what's worthwhile. And, um, uh, I think those questions are going to last for a long time. So X-Men, I think has relevance for that kind of thing. I remember hearing a radio interview, I think it was on NPR of a mom with her autistic son who realized that in watching X-Men, he was watching characters are, who are like him. And he found that they have a place and a, a, a place they could thrive and a place they could survive. And it was very emotional for the mom. And it was emotional for me to listen to that interview, to think that that autistic kid make the jump and he saw himself in the movie and he saw a place that he could fit in. Um, and he found the same place where he was ostracized just as characters in the movie are. That's the subtext and relevance that movies can have. And I think that's why X-Men has endured from the Wolverine movies to the X-Men movies. And it can, will continue to. Um, I think they're going to refresh it at Disney and with Kevin Feige. But um, did, I think did, those did are ever... big questions that underline all yeah. of those movies. Did you ever have any direct contact with Stan Lee or Jack Kirby? All the time with Stan Lee. We have Stan in a couple of movies. I uh, mm -hmm. took Stan under my wing when he came on set on the X-Men movies and Fantastic Four. And, uh, you know, Stan was uh, was a good man. He uh, We had a lot of fun with him. And from the hot dog stand in the first movie to being denied to uh, – uh, uh, Reed Richards um, uh, wedding in, in uh, Fantastic Four. Mm -hmm. So Stan was a great yeah, man. We, uh, we had some discussion uh, with some of the other people on our show. Uh, uh, Billy Gray, you know, who was, who was back in the day, was in was Bud in the Father Knows Best TV series. It was in um, uh, it was Day the Earth in, Stood Still. Day the Earth Stood Still, yeah. Uh, but, you know, talking about uh, the um, kind of the the authoritarianism and the prejudice of the McCarthy era and the things in the 1950s. Yeah. And it, yeah. It, it, read, when you read Stan Lee's biography, uh, he was a young 35-year-old uh, executive editor at um, what was to become right. Marvel Comics. Yeah. And I yeah. remember reading about how he, he you know, when, when they, they went after comics as a way of um, an easy target. Estes Kefauver used his anti-comics thing as a springboard mm. to get the Democratic vice presidential nomination in 1956. Uh, mm. and that story has been told now a number of times. But I don't know, Stan Lee, in his autobiography, would tell about how, uh, because there was all this clamping down on comic books, and some of them really were very uh, extreme, but it went after the whole industry. And he would have to call in an illustrator or a writer and tell him, uh, I've got to, I've got to let you go. I can't afford to keep paying you. You know, everything's going to cut back. Send the guy out, go into his private bathroom, throw up, and then fire the next guy. Yeah. My point of that is that I think Stan Lee experienced this kind of ostracized rejection that is so much at the heart of X Men, and I think he, you know, he, to humanize this, I, I'm, you know, the, the um, graphic novel Mouse was the first comic book to win a Pulitzer Prize. I would think that some of those X-Men would qualify for that. It's possible. I mean, you know, it's hard now with comic book movies so pre prevalent um, in the movie 
um, culture that when we made the first movie in, we shot it in 99 in Toronto, that even the green light process for making that movie, people looked at us cross-eyed because A, they didn't understand that they weren't comic book fans. The only real comic book movie before us was the Tim Burton Batman in 89. And it had not done that well. And, you know, we were now going to spend $75 million on a comic book movie. And I would get calls and looks from people that are like, are you out of your mind? What are you guys doing? Who's risking that kind of money, this kind of venture? Bill Mechanic was the head of the studio who got fired before the movie came out, who was a champion. It was a risk. It was a risk to take on that material. It was a risk to take on those themes. And it was a risk with a director who had really done you know, usual suspects and done nothing else of that size. You know, we were on the edge. But Ralph, if I can interject, um, <clears throat> didn't they have the history of success uh, with the Superman films and Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy DC. films? No, no, that's DC. That's DC. Oh, you're that's, talking about that, DC. I'm sorry. I'm, you're talking about Marvel. Excuse that's right. Me. But that that DC did have some some success with Superman, but I don't know that the culture looked at that as necessarily comic book success that was you know from the 50s in a tv show that was an iconic character that you know batman was a little different although that was a tv show but nobody had ventured outside of superman or batman nobody and that's uh, interesting and um uh, you 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 know you did a few of the fantastic four uh including one the one with the silver surfer uh yes I, again uh I, my, when I tell the story, my, my adult kids go crazy. I had that original Silver Surfer issue. Uh, uh, I bought it, you know, for twelve wow. cents, and uh, wow. I, I was so impressed with the cover. I tore the cover off and put oh, it up on my gosh. wall in my in my college <laughs> dorm. When I tell my kids that, they roll their eyes and say, "What were you thinking?" Yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. nobody in that era who had any idea. Yeah, who knew that we were talking? You're talking about seventy-four million dollars uh, at stake yeah. here. That's a that's a tremendous amount. What? Um, oh, no. Any other thoughts on uh, on the other Marvels, Fantastic Four, or like I say, Silver Surfer? Or? You know the X Men movies. I've made the first four. Um, I like those movies. They're nighttime movies. The X Men characters seem better at night. Their uniforms, the 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 hiding the not wanting to interact with the public. Those are nighttime movies and best suited to that. I fought with the studio about that because night scenes are not as marketable on TV. You can't see as much. The Fantastic Four movies are very different. I think they're younger and they're daytime movies. Those are movies that are out in the broad daylight. Reed Richards wants to be talked to the press. He's okay with that. They walk around. They're interacting with the public, and it's a younger crowd. And again, I fought with the studio on that stuff because they wanted to be more serious. And they made a third Fantastic Four movie after I left, which was darker, and it failed. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so I, I, I loved all of that, and the Silver Surfer, almost a spiritual character uh, in terms of the thematic thrust of that movie. You know, I think. Um, was just, we, we established something that, that Fox didn't really want to build on, unfortunately. And, you know, those movies cost $110, $115 million, but they made $200 million or more. And the head of the studio at the time said that they were failures. And like, well, those are the best damn failures of $200 million I've ever made. Uh, I think there's a more of a history, more of a, more of a, trajectory for those movies that Fox just wasn't, you know, ready to do. So it's all under the stewardship of uh, Kevin Feige now. So, so I think he'll do, he'll do a good job and figure that out. Kevin's pretty smart about the comic book world. Ralph, can I ask you uh, what is exciting for you right now? What project you're working on? I just signed on to do a Disney movie, Hocus Pocus 2, which will shoot New England in the fall. Ironically, I'm so old that I made the first movie in 93. So there's kind of a nice uh, 
circle that completes with that. Uh, Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica, Catherine and Jamie. That'll be fun to do in the fall. I finished a, a pilot with uh, Michael Mann on Tokyo Vice for HBO Max. I did that in Japan last year, and that will probably air later this year on HBO Max. I'm developing a number of projects that, you know, down the road, I think uh, if we can find the financing and studio and distributor could be, you know, relevant, uh, emotional, uh, big stories. The first African-American fighter pilot in World War One who fought wow. in France. Um, and, and, you know, just other kind of original stories that, uh, I'm excited about developing and excited about bringing to the screen movies that I want to see movies that create emotions for me. And I think others will resonate. So I do some for the studios. I do some for me. So, um, you know, you bounce around right. the studios, pay you and I can, you know, spend six months working on my own stuff where no one pays me. And then I go back and do a studio movie where yeah. I can help them make something successful. But, but if we... I can jump in another point here, um, you've, you've been very open in sharing your Christian faith on occasion and uh, yes. you've made a number of Christian films. Uh, yes. Are you still in, in working in that, in that uh, genre? Let me clarify and parse a little bit. I've made films that, I don't know what a Christian film is any more than I know what a Christian plumber is. Um, (laughs) I've made films that relate to the Christian market and are faith friendly. I don't want a Christian plumber. I want somebody that's going to fix my pipes. If he happens to, you know, invite me to his Sunday school class or a prayer meeting, that's good. But can you fix my pipes? Exactly. I I want films and filmmakers who know how to make films. And people come to me and say, hey, we got to work together because we're brothers in Christ. That's not the lead that gets my attention. I want to know Mm -hmm. if they're good at being a prop master or a production designer or visual effects or whatever it is. I want somebody to fix my pipes and then we can relate to each other, you know, outside the business or along the business as, you know, uh, brothers in Christ, but not, I don't lead with that. And I, and I, it terrifies me when people lead with that to try to, you know, get hired by me. Um, yeah, yeah I, I made <laughs> I, I made a bunch of films, two million dollar films at Ted Decker and Frank Peretti. I mm-hmm. unfortunately made the Left Behind movie that uh, did not perform. Or, you know, I originally went after the Left Behind material because I thought it would be interesting in 1999 what people to to talk about what the Bible says about the world ending, because people were concerned about the year 2000 and Y2K and all that stuff. And it, no Christians would, would fund the movie, despite the sales of Jerry Jenkins and, and, and Tim LaHaye's book. No Christians would step up. There was a group in Toronto that did step up for $4 million. We made the movie. But then it became an evangelical tract, which was not what I was intending. I wanted a discussion I want to ask questions. I don't want to provide answers. Move, great movies provide questions. And Left Behind failed at that, and I left my name on it because too many people would have been hurt if I had left the movie. So I went to court to fight with those guys. It was, a, it was ugly, and I wish I could erase that from my resume, but with the Internet, that's not going to happen. Um, I do have a couple of other faith-friendly projects. Um, And I hope I can get those made. One in Texas, I hope I can shoot for a million or so this summer. Um, But it's tricky because (laughs) – you may may cut me off on the phone call now when I say this. Um, Christian audiences are fickle. And the studios look at Christian audiences in, in this way. Don't spend much on a Christian movie. Because those Christians will watch anything. There's no discernment. They they watch crappy movies and good movies. And so if you try to make a movie that caters to the Christian audience, the general attitude at the studios is you don't have to spend much. Don't spend more than a couple million dollars because it doesn't really matter. 
You can make God's Not Dead for a million dollars and we'll make 60 million. Find those movies and make those and you can make money. It's a profit-driven business. It's not about the ethical, philosophical, you know, resonance yeah. of what the movie's about. So yeah. I've tried, you know, listen, I made the movie Captive based on the, the uh, Purpose Driven Life with Rick Warren. And we told the story of Ashley Smith and we upped the level of casting with David Oyelowo and, and Kate Mara and told that story, told the truth. But it doesn't have the sinner's prayer. Brian Nichols does not become a Christian at the end of the movie. He's still in prison and will be for the rest of his life. But it's the true story of Ashley Smith reading a section of the Purpose Driven Life to a killer. And she got his attention and she made an impression on him and he gave himself up to the police. It's an, an amazing story of Brian turning around the path he was going. But Christians didn't agree at all. Ralph, are you uh, of a particular denominational persuasion? I mean, uh, where would you put yourself? I'm a recovering Presbyterian. Well, that's what we are. <laughs> And we're, we're both attend- Presbyterian ministers. Right. Right. I, I love you guys. I've got 30 years in the Presbyterian church as an elder and, and, and going to, you know, synod meetings and general assembly as a delegate and running session and all that stuff. But there's also years of my life arguing about the carpet that I'll never get back. There's a bunch of us that are escapees from the local Presbyterian church that go to a local church here, the Nazarene, Montrose Church, Dave Roberts. It's, you know, straightforward gospel message, very relatable in the community. Um, and we love it there and love what that church community is doing. So, you know, I, I certainly em- embrace that reform theology, but... You know, the denominational mainstream churches are, and particularly with the, the, the last four years of the presidential, they've burned the denominational church to the ground and, and, and left ashes of what's left of any integrity that the culture is going to listen to the mainstream church. That's gone and it's dead and it's been a long journey and unfortunately they burnt the remnants of it with Trump. With that, you may cut me off, but whatever. But there's also, there has been you know, the other thing of the unrelenting scandals in both uh, the Roman Catholic uh, tradition, churches and in a lot of these uh, large independent uh, evangelical churches and schools. I think of like uh, uh, Jerry oh, Falwell yeah. Jr. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. You know, uh, Ravi Zacharias. Uh, they're just. Oh and, yeah. And, and you know, there's. It, you can only say well that there's a, like like with the killing of um, of George Floyd. There's a few bad. Well, no, it gets to the point where there's too many bad apples. You know, <laughs> something's Correct. fundamentally wrong. And uh, I think that's that's also a case of this of these personality driven uh, things. Um, Correct. Willow Creek. But there's uh, a yeah, younger generation just... pushing back. There's a younger generation that wants authentic, relevant faith that's credible. And I think that it, it's sort of a healthy meltdown. It's good for those institutions to be challenged and melt down while new things grow up. So I'm hopeful about some of these local, and maybe that's better. Maybe it's better that we get back to home churches and smaller community churches as opposed to big personalities, yeah. you know, what happens when those uh, big guys go away? You know, come on. Ralph, I wanted to ask you, uh, this, this is a, a heavy kind of a question, you know, being a Christian, uh, and I'm sure, you know, from what I read of you, that, you know, you, you, you know, we all fail, but you try to put the will of Jesus before everything else. You know, do you come across films that you say, you know, this is a great film, but boy, there are some things in here that I have a hard time with. I don't know if I can work in this film. And a, a lot of that could also be with Christian films. You know, some of them are so hokey that you say, you know, this is not to me what, what Jesus would, would, would affirm. I, I know I thought about this today, uh, yesterday, uh, when I just watched a new film by Russell Crowe 
called Unhinged. I don't know if you've seen oh, yeah. that yet. I've not seen it. And it really before. shows, yeah, it really shows human nature at its worst. Uh, you know, where Christian films many tr- times try to show human nature at its best. And, you know, the Ozzy and Harriet kind of uh, smiling faces and so forth. But, you know, you, you I, I would imagine there are times you walk a fine balance by, by you know, asking yourself, uh, what do I see in this film that uh, I think it, I can work with? And what do I see in this film that's going to be difficult for me? Can you share anything of that? Sure. Let me, uh, I can answer that in a couple of ways. I think that as, a, as it relates to a particular project, it's rare that the material, I don't make the decision based on the material only. It's the people around it. It's, um, you know, is it going to get made? Is, it, uh, is there some worth and intrinsic value in, in, in seeing this, you know, get into the marketplace? So, for instance, on the first Hocus Pocus nearly 30 years ago, I took a lot of heat from the Christian community. Um, how can you work on a movie that has witches in it? How can you do that? I mean, aren't you promoting witchcraft? Aren't you, you know, uh, doing something that violates your faith? And, you know, sometimes, you know, being involved in a project isn't about putting in the positive things that, you know, why don't the witches, you know, <laughs> have the sinner's prayer at the end of the movie or something like that, something ridiculous. But sometimes it's the things you can keep out of a movie. Sometimes it's just your presence in the room in developing a story that, you know, make a difference. Um, and as people began to push, I remember some very public discussions I had up front with people asking me these questions. And I would say to people, which is, this hasn't changed at all. Have you seen the movie? Did you watch the movie? Do you know what the story's about? The story's about a boy who gives his life for his sister so that she's not taken away by the witches. The witches get their comeuppance, and he sacrifices his life for his sister. Does that remind you of anything? Does that tickle anything that you think about as a Christian of someone who sacrifices their life for someone else? So... Believe me, there was a yeah. little bit of joy in me when Disney contacted me about Hocus Pocus 2 because I've had 30 years of people coming at me with arguments about Hocus Pocus 1, and I'm ready to bring it on. You know? Well, I know Paul, yeah, I know uh, Paul and I, when, the, when Scorsese's film Last Temptation of Christ came out, yeah. there was just a yeah. whirlwind of condemnation. Now, Paul and I went to New York because we felt as ministers of the gospel. And because of all the notoriety and so forth, we needed to go see that film ourselves. And yep. we saw it, and we, we, we gave some um, reviews that were positive on it because I said this is the first film that really addresses the fact that Jesus went through what all of us go through, yet somehow yep. mysteriously without sin. But he was sexually yep. tempted. You know, one guy asked me, do you think Jesus ever got horny? And he wasn't trying to be mm-hmm. blasphemous or funny. Mm-hmm. He's saying, as a human mm-hmm. being, I get, I'm a Christian, and it's hard to see these beautiful women yeah. all over. And my first response is, boy, I wish I could just do something. Did Jesus ever have that temptation? My response was yes, but he did not mm-hmm. act on it. You know, uh, mm-hmm. but this is, the, you go crazy trying to please the Christian community. You really do. You can't win sometimes. Well, you, and you can't, when he, yeah. he, he, so I don't, uh, I don't try he, to. And I'm more of an antagonistic, and in, in some ways, people are afraid to engage with me about it. Now, the, in terms of popular culture and movies, let me give you two more things. One is uh, my friend Kevin Kelly, uh, who's a Christian, who was the senior Maverick editor and one of the founders of Wired magazine. Recently, uh, you know, a couple of hints, he said, when you take a project, you should think about three things. Number one, knowledge. Number two, fun. Number two, three. And number three, finance. Knowledge. Is it, am I going to learn something? Is this going to enhance my career? Am I going to learn something about filmmaking or what I'm doing or add value to what my profession is? Number two, is it going to be fun? Am I going to – I work too hard and too many hours 
to work with jerks and to work on something that's going to be painful? And number three, is it going to be worthwhile financially? Some movies I do for free. Some movies I work at the studios and they pay me. And I got to check the box on two out of three before I do a project. If I can check two out of three, I can do it. If I can't check any more than one, not worth it. Now, in terms of popular movies, I'd run a Sunday school class. Didn't do it this year because of COVID. But when I'm in town, I run a Sunday school class in my church. And my class is about the best picture nominees. Today's Oscar Sunday. For those of us in Hollywood, if it wasn't a Sunday, it'd be a holiday because we don't get anything done. It's all about the Oscars tonight. You're spending too much time primping and getting your car ready and getting your bow tie done and writing your speech. Um, But I run a class for the best picture. So there's nine best picture nominees. Then nine weeks before the Oscars, my Sunday school class starts. And I'll assign a picture. And your job, if you want to come to my Sunday school class, is, okay, week one, we're going to watch Nomadland. And you're going to bring your Bible. Watch the movie before you come to class. Bring your Bible. And we're going to talk about what's the filmmaker on Nomadland trying to achieve? What's the story about? How do we understand stories? How do you um, understand what a good story is? And what's the author trying to the filmmaker trying to say. And then secondly, we look at, you know, how does that match up with what we believe as Christians? Is it true? Is it not? What does the Bible say about that? And I have about 65 people in our small church that come to that class when I run it. And most of them love it. Once in a while, I'll get an old timer that comes in and corners me before class and he'll say something like, hey, Ralph, let's tell you something. I wasted two hours of my life watching Nomadland. And you better have the answer today, or I'm never coming back to this class because I don't understand what the hell this this woman was talking about. So you better have some answers. Mm. I love those questions because by the end of the class, generally those guys come up to me at the end and go, okay, that was good. I'll be back next week. (laughs) You know, that's what we used to do in my men's group. I would show a Twilight Zone uh, every men's group, we'd watch it, and then we'd ask those kinds of questions because it was yeah. a marvelous takeoff. We, we, in an earlier uh, session, uh, Ralph did a discussion of um, uh, a promising young woman. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, we did. We, we spent a whole session on that film. That's cool. That's great. And, and, you know, look, I think that's also, we've done things at our home here where we do food fun film, where we'll watch a movie about food, say Big Night with Stanley Tucci, because he's sort of in the news these days. And we'd come, open a bottle of wine, watch the movie, and then we'd make the food in the movie. And then we'd talk about movies and life. And it's a great way to bring in people, nothing about faith that's overt, but it inevitably comes to those kinds of discussions. And you do it over the sort of, you know, easy thing about a movie and um, enjoying it and then talking about what it means. That's the joy, I think, of uh, movies and the journey that a hero goes on that resonates with people and, and resonates over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, one of the questions we're asked as Presbyterian ministers when we take our vows, that is, and I believe we do so with elders, that is often least, uh, you know, least thought about or acted on is, will you serve the Lord with imagination? Yeah. Is that true, <laughs> yeah. Paul? Yeah. Imagination. In other words, will you, yeah. rather than being a lockbox, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, rather than just having all the, you know, Lord Jones, a great Christian preacher, said, the key to Christian wisdom is not having all the answers, but knowing the right questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other, and, the other uh, side of it, too, is that you have, uh, uh, you know, in, in Scripture, you, you, you have just, just depictions of sin that go way beyond what you'd, you'd see in almost any Hollywood movie. And that's I always correct. make the point, it said the, the one book is as well established in the Western canon that has more monsters than any than in the other one is the Bible. Don't tell yeah. me the behemoth was a hippopotamus. No, <laughs> it's you know, yeah, don't, it's don't a be, monster. Don't be going, don't be going making movies on the Book of Judges. Don't read that. Oh yeah, that's R-rated, man. That's R-rated. 
And you know, well, look, and, and some I'll, other I'll go a little further. Too. Yes, my my feeling is this, and I think I could support this pretty well. Most the Bible's five or six hundred stories. Most of those stories are dark. The most popular parable, the prodigal son, begins with the son telling his father, "I want him dead, so I can have my inheritance." Now. It doesn't much of a darker opening to a story than that. And, you know, from David and Bathsheba to Moses, all of the stories are dark. But I think that's why the Bible continues to be relevant is because the stories reflect the world we live in and the darkness around us. Because nobody has the happy life that's projected in Christian movies. You know, a Christian, you know, you know what you get when you play a country song backwards? You get your car back, you get your wife back, you get your dog back, you get your job back. I don't have those. That's not my life. That doesn't happen to me. That doesn't happen to people I know. That's not the life that, that, that following Christ promises you. Not at all. Right. And, and the dark stories that are in the Bible are always going to be relevant. They're always going to have you know, a touch point in our culture because that's the world, the fallen world we live in. And that's why it's always going to be resonating in the culture for generations to come. Yeah, it's uh, my, my particular area of interest, and I've had people bring this up with me, but I've done this for uh, over 40 years now, is uh, writing on horror films from a Christian perspective. Yes. And yes. one of my arguments right away is, the horror film uniquely among other film genres deals with the problem of evil because it focuses on the supernatural reality of evil or the extraordinary aspect of evil, not, not just the normal evil to people getting, you know, you, you kill somebody you don't like. No, something much darker, if you will. But that's the world that scripture talks about. That's the, yes. you know, the darkness uh, and the reality of the, with the Scott demonic. Harrison that, about this. Yeah. The, uh, the first miracle in Mark's gospel is uh, a demon is, has come into uh, the synagogue in the middle of the mm. service mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and, and yeah. is throwing out all this stuff. So um, I said that, that that's um, I mean, and, and if horror films only present the evil, they get to be very, very bad. There's a lot of them like that. But there's plenty of others that have that when you talk about the redemptive idea someone giving their life for someone else uh, or the power of the cross. I mean, it's uh, uh, the first That's supernatural right. horror film in American history is Dracula, which is, you know, today is very dated. Bela Lugosi's, you know, performance is terrific. But, it, you know, but uh, that film makes it abundantly clear as to where is the power? Where is the power? You know, in this great bit where um, uh, Dracula says to Von Helsing, more Wolfbane, Doctor? There's no count. Something far more powerful. <coughs> he pulls out the cross, you know, and Dracula, that famous yeah. thing of, you know, throws the cape over his head. And it makes it clear that there's power in the cross. <laughs> it's, Absolutely right. Well, well, do you believe and in most yeah. cases, good wins out in those movies. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and yeah. Scott Derrickson, who's done a lot of horror movies, is a, uh, a strong Christian. He, he's been a spokesperson for that. And he welcomes people to take him on from the Christian community about horror movies. Um, he's very articulate, was a philosophy major out of USC. He's uh, very successful about that. He directed Dr. Strange and some other stuff. But uh, and the, and the, the Exorcism of Emily Rose is one of his most successful. Yeah. Uh, along with Sinister, which was a horror movie. But yeah, you know, you're exactly right. And the, the problem is people only want to see what they want to see in movies, and they don't look at what the intention is. So that's part of my Sunday school class, is try to help people to yeah. read a movie, to understand what it is that the story's about. It's not just about a catchy line or one scene. What's the point of the movie? Why are they making the movie? And to me, to serve with imagination, filmmakers are the prophets uh, – you know, about our culture. They're the ones who are looking at culture and reinterpreting that in a way that has impact. 
uh, and resonance in a way that you couldn't possibly have imagined. And so you begin to see these movies and watch them again and again that have power that, you know, news articles and other stuff just wouldn't have. Um, and they, they live on. So, uh, you know, filmmakers are the prophets. And um, mm-hmm. I, I think they're the ones we should be looking to in terms of yeah. where the culture is going and what we should pay attention to. We're not naive in the sense that there can also be false prophets, you know, uh, as there were in Scripture. Sure requires discernment and understanding and so forth. But you're certainly right in asking the question, what is the movie about? Not just what is the plot, but what is the movie really about thematically? I think as story... They don't understand that. Yeah. I I think as storytellers, um, and it hasn't translated always into the best films or short films, but, you know, Ray Bradbury had that gift to capture your imagination like few other yeah. people did. And uh, yeah. I would love to see some remakes of of some of his stories, like Something Wicked This Way Comes, because it has a great story, but it wasn't done as well as I would have liked to have seen. Yeah. Capturing on people's uh, vanity, if you would. You know, like Satan said, you know, uh, you, you can have anything you want, you know, and when you get it, you don't want it after you realize what the cost is. Well, I really appreciate having you that. on. Uh, you bet, yeah. You bet. Thank yeah. you very much for calling. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Yeah, it was great Thank talking you. with you, Ralph. Yeah. You take care. Okay. God bless. Thanks so much. All right. All right Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to me. It's ten times the terror. The podcast. You are impossible. Ralph, you're well intentioned. Well. Thank you for listening to Ten Times the Terror. This podcast would not be possible without listeners like you. You can find out more about our podcast by visiting our website, 10timestheterror.com. That's 10xtheterror.com.